Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. In two days, Thomas will be 50 years old. 50 and a half, I believe, is what they say about that age. The other day, his pretty young secretary, Alice, always flapping her thickly painted eyelashes in response to his orders and moving like a thoroughbred foal with long slender legs, said to the chief, Thomas, the banquet at the restaurant I ordered of the highest level, or rather, she corrected herself on the eternal greyhound move. I went to the most elite catering service. They will bring everything and immediately decorate the hall, deliver bartenders, waiters, dishwashers. The food and drinks are the most exquisite, serving in the style of a romantic collection. Toastmasters, hosts, and hosts of the evening, live music, animators, concert numbers for the audience. They have everything turnkey. You will be satisfied. I consulted with your wife, but Aloma said I could act on my own. She trusts me completely. Thomas grimaced painfully, once again stated the fact to himself. My wife, Ilona. He grinned maliciously to himself. A tramp, a pathetic semblance of a lawful spouse, which would have been his status as a well-known businessman in their provincial town, on whom a lot depended in the village. They met in Barcelona, that wonderful capital of Catalonia, where he often flew on business, and on the call of his heart. Thomas, on his favorite architectural wave, never missed the great stone masterpieces of the world. So here he was, looking at the creations of Antoni Gaudi. That's when he was attacked, like a fury, tall, slender brunette in trendy sunglasses. Man, I certainly understand that you're admiring the most beautiful landmark in the city, but maybe you shouldn't be standing on the path to it. Thomas looked over the nuisance to his right charmingly, smiled, and replied, When you see something like that, both time and thought, and the desire to move freeze, I hope my state of being a statue has not caused you any significant harm. Ilumma the beautiful, and it was her charming, smiled back at him, and quite reasonably said, I'm an art historian too. Always come to a state of anabiosis near the legacy of Gaudi. I understand you perfectly. They spent the rest of his business trip to the Spanish city unobtrusively together. The stranger turned out to be an excellent conversationalist with a vast vocabulary something Thomas had always appreciated in people. Her model-like appearance, her ability to present herself stylishly and tastefully dressed, was also an undeniable plus. To swing around a vibe of aristocratic charm, on the fishing rod of all these charms divorced for the second time, the man fell like a big fish, not understanding what kind of catcher he got as a reward. Ilona was thirty-five years old, but she looked younger. She had two years of student marriage behind her and a series of novels, which she told her new beau without concealment. The woman flew to Barcelona, as he did, on business, but she had already successfully resolved all issues. Thomas, like the victim behind the hypnotized Indian cobra, swallowed the hook without any doubts. He was sure that here, at last, he had met the very person who would constitute his marital happiness. After a short marriage with his second wife, a woman with black hair, gorgeous eyes, and long blood-colored fingernails, it had been several years. Early disappointments lingered. Thoughts that it was better to live alone gave way to thoughts of a normal family nest with a baby, a Christmas tree and tangerines at New Year's with trips to the sea, with fresh buns in the evenings when the extractor returns from a business hunt. The time of three months that he left for himself to make a decision Alomna behaved impeccably. He couldn't have dreamed of anything better. Later, when he began to see things through, he thought about several questions at once. Why all the agreements and contracts in the business sphere of his future wife became at once completely uninterested in her. Partners and important calls that she was constantly receiving in Spain went down the drain. The offer of cooperation in the field of fine arts appreciation evaporated. And he was also embarrassed to ask himself, what was he thinking, falling in love with this nothing, in a beautiful rapper? Why she immediately agreed to move to him in the province from the beautiful Peter, whereas if before she met him. In love, Thomas during this period he did not notice anything around him, 
coked up like a grouse during the mating games. Luxury restaurants, gifts. A bank card with a tidy sum for Ilona's small expenses. Wouldn't he be sorry to share those crumbs for his beloved? He was willing to do more than that. It was nothing. They'd been married a little over a year. He even removed many clauses from the marriage contract this time. So as not to offend such a beautiful lady, he left out the little things. About adultery, about his wife's inability to interfere in his business regarding assets, previously acquired real estate, foreign accounts. But he wrote a paragraph about the obligatory birth of an heir. He is fifty years old and still does not have children. This has always seemed like a special nightmare to him. But the issue pathologically didn't work out. The first disappointment that surprised him was waking up in their now common home after their first wedding night. The words of his newlywed spouse sounded like a bowl of ice water. Puja, could you make me some orange juice? I do not like in the morning immediately jump out of a warm bed and run into the kitchen. Thomas turned green and dumbfounded at the same time. He was a successful businessman, an acknowledged guru for designing future masterpieces in the stone architecture niche, endlessly in love with his architectural business, a serious and wise partner to his colleagues, a loving parent and brother, a family man, not some cartoon or melodramatic character who wanted to be treated that way. Perhaps he was wrong about something. Many couples who are close to each other call each other all sorts of funny and amusing nicknames. He was struck now by the stark contrast, the tone of behavior in her voice. This and the old Iloma, not one who had ever stooped to familiarity and vulgarity before. In his head for some reason I remembered a scene from the movie Twelve Chairs, adaptation of his favorite novel by Ilf and Petrov. Husik, that refined, intelligent, well-mannered Ilona he met near the holy cloister in the capital of Catalonia, and the woman who lay ugly on the bed in his bedroom, with a disgruntled expression, in response to his refusal to go to squeeze the juice from the oranges. There were two different personalities, which one he married. It was hard to tell. What did I actually expect? Thomas asked himself. We'd never had a meal at home together before. I had never seen this woman in action, just to iron my shirt or sew a button on my pants. We had a carefree time. I'm an idiot. Didn't even think about that side of life together. Thought the household and the hearth was a heaven-given mate's job. Wrong. Again. Disappointingly, wrong. Their further family life after that miserable morning did not roll along the smooth happy road, but along the track with bumps, holes, and piles of gravel. The love in his heart began to fade. The morass dissipated. He plunged back into his work. Fortunately, the binder of technical assignments from customers never grew thin. Occasionally, they would leave the moon for some sort of formal event. They dined or dined at expensive restaurants where everyone concentrated on their chosen dish, not eager to talk. A couple of times his beautiful wife accompanied him on overseas business trips, but they spent their travel time differently. He at meetings with potential clients, she by the pool, in the hotel, spa complexes, stores, shopping, where the monthly allowance he determined her not joking. He could afford it. There was no hurry to get a divorce. There was no time for that. Sometimes lazily and reluctantly performed his marital duty. But I have to hand it to you, the Lona in bed, too, did not show any more initiative and did not burn desire, as before. What's wrong with me? Thomas thought sometimes. God had not dealt with my looks or my manhood. My health so far, thou shalt not jinx it. Why did I grow cold so quickly to my last two wives, or didn't love them to begin with? I hunted like that. It was the excitement and the ambition. The best woman in my life long ago was Anne. But it wasn't fate there either. He was madly in love with his first wife, Anne raved about her, agreed never topple her from her pedestal. But love karma had already begun its mysterious games with him. And who was a slender brunette. She was the prettiest girl in their class at the Architectural Institute. She was making eyes at him like a badass, especially when she found out he was about to be crowned a star in his profession. 
His betrothed was disappointed in her chosen profession as early as her third year. When the subjects of her specialization were closer and closer, she confused Art Nouveau and Baroque, could not see the peculiarities of the style of stone architecture as if she was blind. Teachers soon gave up on the negligent student, especially in the group with such a leader, such a promising, such a talented young man like Thomas. Fellow students could only marvel at the fact that everyone's coursework, unencumbered by complexity, was a masterpiece from Thomas. His ideas shone through, boiled over sinful earth, freezing with beauty and originality. In his fifth year, he won a competition to design the city's philharmonic building. The structure was built in his style and spirit, without a single flaw or refinement by more experienced architects. Now the house was already an antique and a hallmark of their settlement. The elegant, no-frills white piano building adorned the main artery of the city and, along with several other memorable structures, was the centerpiece of all sightseeing routes. Young mothers and grandmothers were strolling with baby carriages on the benches in a small park near the musical kingdom, exchanging in a long talk invaluable experience of bringing up the new generation. The talented master was called to Moscow and to Street Petersburg. But then Thomas's parents began to age sharply, married to him, and was pregnant. There was nowhere to go to conquer the metropolitan horizons, especially since he had a little brother who was confined to a wheelchair. The boy was already fifteen, but his legs remained in childhood. Doctors diagnosed him with a rare limb disorder. His body grows, but his legs always lag behind. That's why they can't cope with the weight. They can't lift him upright. With Anne at first Thomas lived soul to soul, until the house began to have free money. In his wife, who had never before known expensive clothes or flashy jewelry or delicacies in the fridge, it was as if an evil force had entered. Thomas, I want that ring and that dress and that purse. I've got black caviar and raw smoked sausage coming tonight. Don't forget to leave some money. Anne was no longer interested in anything but money. She quickly became cold to her newborn daughter and stopped breastfeeding her. In order not to spoil her figure, loved her only for walks in the square near the Philharmonic to go to the other mothers to piss off the imported stroller color red pucka and new shoes on strikingly long heels. But who goes for a walk with a child in such shoes? With Thomas's parents and brother, I didn't want to share the goods. The fashionable, very popular in the city architect, who was being torn into one hundred pieces by all the construction companies, hardly had time to cover all the material needs of his wife. It got to the point that his beloved Anne began to make him stash, so he did not think of another family to feed and pamper. Anne tried to get rid of her growing daughter by sending her to five-day kindergarten. I'm so tired with her beloved, so much to do every day. The child is a burden, a legitimate one, of course, but it's like she's tying me in hand and foot. I found an elite private kindergarten, the first one in the city. It's gonna cost a lot of money, but there's only five kids in the group. They'll teach our baby everything. We'll get her ready to learn manners and first science. Thomas has just returned from London. He'd been sent there as a young talent for an exhibition. Even fought then in Britain, the system of education of children in specialized boarding houses is considered a panacea. Maybe and is right. So Polly will quickly acquire the communication skills of being first in the children's and then in the adult community. Their daughter's fate was sealed. With her parents, she now saw only Saturday and Sunday was already five years, was a very independent child. Indeed, mastered many things that she is unlikely to have been taught by her good-for-nothing mommy. Little Polly felt like a stranger in her own home on weekends, and then one day, the real trouble came knocking at their new apartment. Among the sciences taught in the private kindergarten were such skills as the basic basics of housekeeping. After breakfast or lunch together, Polly was always picked up from the table to take the dishes to the kitchen. This time, too, she was carrying crystal wine glasses. She overdid it and tripped hard on the threshold. The fragile glass beauty in her still not the most skillful hands broke into two halves. Falling down, 
The girl severely cut her forehead with the sharp edges of the glass. The wound immediately took a clear crescent shape. The doctors at the trauma center, where Thomas and Anne rushed to, could only wonder. A pattern appeared on the little girl's forehead. A laceration that mimicked the top of a broken glass. The important vessels weren't affected, the doctor summarized. But you would have to have plastic surgery. The scar will be very large. It will ruin your baby's face. In Russia, a pediatric plastic surgeon worthy of fully removing this ugly blemish is impossible to find. You will have to fly to a clinic in Switzerland. And how much would it cost for such surgical intervention in Europe? Anne immediately asked a question that worried her. Maybe we can't afford such a treatment. Thomas paled at this question and at his wife's hasty conclusions. No matter how much it costs, we'll sell the apartment. We'll live at mine. I'll take out a loan, after all. How can you, Anne, calculate the possible costs in the future like that? Anne bit her tongue, but she didn't give up on her thoughts inside. Their conversation was overheard by the trauma surgeon and reassured them both. The girl won't need plastic surgery anytime soon. We have everything neatly stitched up now. Daily dressings will dry up the wound and initiate healing. You won't get back to the question of a trip abroad for at least a year. You'll have time to prepare and raise the necessary amount of money. Thomas, Anne, and Polly soon arrived home from the hospital, where the man no longer knew how to distract his daughter from the pain and the misfortune that had occurred. Anne seemed thoughtful at first. She took no part in their affectionate fiddling. But then she came down. A disc of colorful cartoons was watched together in the evening. It was decided that Polly would not go back to kindergarten yet, and would live at home with her mother. The year after the girl's serious injury flew by quickly and safely. The wound on her forehead healed well. But the scar, as the doctor predicted, did remain impressive. Thomas began to have more and more conversations with Anne about the time to choose a clinic in Europe for Polly. Soon the little girl will go to first grade. By then we need to make sure that her face is no longer a mark. His wife listened attentively and expressed her willingness to go abroad with Polly as soon as possible. But when Thomas brought her the draft of the contract from Lausanne, she changed her face and turned pale. A stay in a medical institution was to cost the family a pretty penny. It was a lot of money. If Thomas and Anne quickly sold the country house, recently built especially for a summer vacation with the baby, and their two luxury foreign cars, their luxurious, fully equipped apartment would remain with them. It had only recently been purchased, in spite of the devastation reigning around it. Outside the window, the realities of the rogue nineties were raging. But Thomas remained afloat. Moreover, he was endlessly respected and honored by all those new Russian gentlemen who wanted to have houses individually designed by the celebrated architect. True, the money from the foreign currency account would also have to be spent. To live in Lausanne on the shores of Lake Geneva Anne and her daughter were to stay for at least two months. Recently Anne had grown very fond of her two new girlfriends. The young women were the lucky ones who had ridden from dirt to riches on the strong backs of their husbands. Both were sweethearts and dolls. Pretty faces, shapely legs, and trimmed every other part of the body. How much artificial tuning was in their appearance? Only an expert could tell. Both had lived their lives on endless treatments in beauty salons, learned to ride horses, play lawn tennis, and even run a yacht for laughs at the local teenage sea fan club. Anne felt honored to be around such advanced young ladies, of course, sharing her domestic woes and the news of impending expenses with them. You're out of your mind. Throwing away that kind of money on an ephemeral opportunity, tweaked the girl's face. That was the verdict of one. That's a lot of money to take out of your hands. Why? Times are shaky with cash and accounts. You've got to put off this unnecessary surgery until a later date. When your Polly grows up, she'll be formed. Then you'll decide if you need to invest in her. But the doctor said we're wasting our time. Anne, who had not yet completely lost what was left of her mother's conscience, tried to argue weakly. Thomas will never agree with my argument that it's an unnecessary expense. He loves his daughter too much. One of the Dolly darlings leaned into her ear and whispered fervently, and you put on a show that the girl is missing, 
gone, lost. I even know where we can pull this off. Thomas was sitting in his office when a worried Anne called him. Honey, we're in trouble. We went for a walk with Polly on the boardwalk, and they offered me a ride on the water in a motorboat. On the way, my stomach twisted, and I told the girl not to go anywhere from her seat in the enclosed cabin where we were eating ice cream. When I came back there was only her baby purse and a teddy tiger cub on the seat. Polly herself was like she'd fallen through the ground. The rescuers on the boat had already raised the alarm, but they had not yet been able to find our daughter. What about the purse and the tiger cub? With excitement, Thomas began to stutter. Are you kidding me? Tell me you're kidding me. But the woman only sighed back. Twenty minutes later, the man was already at the river. The boat had already docked at the wharf. But the passengers were not allowed ashore, and were waiting for the police and search dogs to arrive. An interrogation of the few witnesses did not yield anything. Only about thirty people had gone on the boat ride with Anne and their daughter. They were all enjoying the beauty of the shoreline on the upper open deck. The cashier confirmed that two tickets had been purchased. There were one for adults and one for children. The ticket inspector was saying with an apologetic voice, I was distracted while calling my son, I had to run to the phone. Then she tear off the travel coupons with a stub with the stamp, paid on it. I didn't keep track of who was going in and out, and the girl couldn't get off the ship. When they started looking for her, we were still in the middle of the river, between the two banks. Testimonies of eyewitnesses in general were reduced to the fact that nobody paid much attention to the young woman with the daughter. Were, were not on the upper deck, did not go up to the rest of the company. Someone seemed to be sitting at a table near the buffet. It was hard to say who it was. Anne was dropping tears and repeating the same thing. I had to go to the bathroom right away. Polly was very quiet. She was playing with her favorite tiger cub and eating popsicles. She hadn't even started drinking lemonade yet. Then she disappeared like she vanished into thin air. The version of the investigation resulted in a summary. The girl slowly slipped out of the closed cabin in the open space. She might have been interested in something overboard and slipped into the water. The staff of the ship swore that the person overboard he could not miss in any way. But all objections of the personnel were written off as negligence. It was decided that if the incident had really happened, the body would have been swept to the shore by the current. But as they say, no body, no case. The search went on for more than a week, but was inconclusive. Thomas had used all his resources, all his connections, all his money, to investigate. He promised a large financial reward to anyone who could shed some light on the story. He couldn't look at Anne, couldn't talk to her, thought she was to blame for what had happened. The threat of divorce loomed over their family. Anne began to look more and more often into the shot glass, hovering in some kind of thought. She was acting strangely. At such moments, Thomas shook her like a peer. Just admit it, wasn't it? Everything happened differently. But she kept silent like a partisan. Just clapped her eyes and became more and more distant from her husband, so that she stopped drinking the man deprived her of access to his earnings, and she herself had not worked for a long time. Kind of like babysitting her daughter. Anne knew very well where her daughter herself had handed her over quietly from the boat to a friend who drove her car up to the pier. But things had gone so far. Thomas was so worried and so changed that she realized she had made an irreparable mistake. Never would he forgive her plan to hide her daughter from public view for a while and not spend money on an operation in Switzerland. Even her friends after all these events began to avoid her. It is one thing to develop the concept of saving Anne's money under the influence of alcohol, and quite another to commit a real crime, which clearly fell under several articles at once. A couple of months later, the same accomplice who had assisted Anne in the operation made an appointment to meet her at their favorite café. She spoke quickly and crumpled, said her husband had been offered a hefty contract in Canada, and she was flushing. She added angrily, looking her former colleague in the eye. So the woman wouldn't even think of blabbing anything to anyone. She would present it to her husband properly. 
and he'll wipe Anne off the face of the earth. She had him and his brothers fishing bigger fish in troubled waters. After that shootout with his girlfriend, actually, who came up with the whole cunning plan, Anne went completely off the rails, in some dark but warm company of young people, and she still looked like a girl. She started taking all kinds of substances. In an era of total unsanitation, there was little concern for hygiene in such societies. So, six months later, Anne caught a serious disease. Things got even more mixed up and confused. And if before she was still going to visit her daughter in a remote, remote village where a friend had taken the child to her lonely aunt, then now has lost interest in the girl. The circle was closed. At that time, the court finally divorced the couple. Polly was declared missing. Support and encouragement for Thomas remained only his parents and now grown-up brother. A tribute must be paid to the younger man. All that was not given to his legs he was still moving around in a wheelchair went to his bright head. His sedentary lifestyle had chosen for him the profession of an iron specialist. The guy was clever with computers. He learned cunning programs, prepared presentations of his projects for his brother. He was already earning decent money himself and was helping out his elderly parents. For some time now, Thomas's brother had an affair on the net with a similarly destitute girl. She too was content to be in a wheelchair, and she didn't hide it from her online contacts. All the others, when they found out that the pretty young lady could not walk, disappeared at the speed of light. It would have gone on like that. But she met a kindred spirit, and although they lived a thousand miles away from each other, the technical possibilities allowed them to see each other on the computer and talk days and nights, and then work together on a job for Thomas. The girl turned out to be an expert in all kinds of shops, the same ones that make an ugly aunt a princess, and sometimes even a beauty queen. Aunt Mary was well known in their village of five dozen yards. In fact, with such a large population at the edge of a dense mixed forest, they knew not only Mary the healer, but also each other by name. The husband of a 52-year-old woman had perished in the woods. He was a hunter. Hiking in the company of men has always been a favorite pastime. And in the second half of the 90s, the bad guys went off the rails. Jack's been guarding his domain for years. And that day he didn't. Mary didn't like the guests, all in bright-colored striped tracksuits and leather jackets, like some kind of buffoon's uniform. Their mouths were full of gold teeth. They've got tattoos on their hands. Oh, it's no use going into the woods with such fancy men. How can you hold Jack back? Don't you worry, said her broad-shouldered husband, all princely, like a strong mighty oak. I'll take them to the swamp for ducks. Maybe the swamp will take away their desire to pull the devil's whiskers. The ducks, then, indeed, the leathery fellows, have had their fill. But they came back with bad tidings that Jack stumbled in the swamp, leading them along the cherished path. He went quickly beneath the sludge. They didn't even try to help save him. The militia came. The police came and stabbed the edge of the swamp with beards, looking for Jack's body. And Mary knew right away that there was something fishy going on. Her fiancé knew the woods like the back of his hand. He could only drown if he was already unconscious in the swamp with a wound. What the Bratskys were whispering about with the district officer and the rest of the authorities. The unfortunate woman was unaware. Only everyone went away happy with each other. The incident was filed as an accident. The divisional policemen soon bought a motorcycle and a sidecar. Where did the money come from? The village peasantry. Another mystery. One day his family was struggling to make ends meet. The next he was riding a brand new motorcycle across the countryside. He and his husband were both from this region. In the old days, young people did not flee from the village to the city like that. So they both grew up and found a job in their second homeland. They both went 15 kilometers one way to the secondary school in the neighboring village. For a villager, it's no big deal if the village bus was out of order and the kids were walking to class. So they were walking through the snow or stunted autumn leaves. They had time to talk about everything, drag the kids by the arms. They would not leave the small villagers in the field, not traveling, still getting used to the hardships of life in the countryside. 
Mary went to medical school in the district center and later graduated as a paramedic. Jack went to a forestry technical school. After receiving their degrees, both returned home without hesitation. That's when their love gained its final momentum. They married for true love, without any excuses or unnecessary suffering. They lived by subsistence farming, fishing in their picturesque lake with sandy shores, gifts of forest. All the same, this corner of nature would have long been overlooked by cunning city businessmen. There was one hitch. The marshes would have to be drained and the school would have to be developed. Why was it such a long way to get there? A detour around the slimy reservoir had to be made while there were no willing to tinker with the muddy slurry in places completely impassable. That is how the village withered in the early 90s. The vogue of living in large agglomerations to be urban is already in full swing around the country chagall. As a result, the sturdiest families remained here. Mary and Jack's only misfortune and pain was the death of their little boy. The boy caught a cold and pneumonia. His mother's paramedical knowledge was not enough to get him out of the clutches of the terrible disease. The snow of the last spring snowfall did not reach the hospital, in which the boy was floundering with cans for a couple of days before. And then all of a sudden the thaw drove away the car while they pulled out their little boy burnt in the flames of high temperature. The little heart couldn't take it. Later the doctor said that he had had a weak heart from birth, but there were no symptoms. So they missed the attack. The second blow was the news that Mary could have no more children. The fact that she had managed to give birth to her first child was already a physiological mishap. That was all her body was capable of. Jack listened to the news, hugged his wife in silence, and said, You are my joy, and God decides the rest. So we are not given. We will live together with people and help little animals and birds. That is your fate and mine. They did not return to this conversation. They longed for their son, of course, but they did not tear each other apart. Each went about his business. They were learning new skills in their professions. Jack improved his skills. Physical strength multiplied the forest of his ward studied in detail. Mary took a great interest in collecting herbs. She bought all the reference books on medicinal plants if she went to town, treated neighbors and pets, a sick cow in their home hospital, a wounded hare brought by Jack from the woods. They lived and tried to live. After Jack's death, Mary had a hard time. And it wasn't just that there were no more men in the household. It wasn't even that her soulmate was taken from her by the heavens. My parents were in the graveyard by then. Farm labor is not easy. Often the hard laborers go into the ground early only one niece among my relatives. She was the seventh water on the river. She lived in town and was married to one of those new Russians. Didn't see each other often, if not very rarely. A couple of times, the maiden wanted exoticism. She came for country food. She took some fresh milk but didn't manage to keep it. She was greedy, and she wasn't smart enough to process it. I couldn't cook chickens at home, so I made a broth with small feathers. The era of housekeepers hadn't come into force yet. Somehow the household was kept behind closed doors by housewives. Society didn't know, didn't guess. Mary only clutched her head when her niece told her about these exploits. And then one summer day a relative knocked on the door again. And not alone, with a little girl in her arms. Open the gate, mistress. I was on my way to see you, and I got caught up in a story. The niece began to lie on the doorstep. Only Mary was a light-hearted soul. She couldn't recognize hypocrisy and lies. She snatched the little girl from her relative's arms. She saw at once that the little girl was tired and unnaturally sleepy, where even an experienced paramedic to immediately recognize that the woman a bottle of water in which it was dissolved a hoarse dose of sleeping pills slipped it was not with the hands of her to ask her unnecessary questions on the road. The narrative, chilling. From my niece's lips it sounded like, I decided, Aunt Mary, to come visit you. I stopped for gas on the way to the gas station, and there in the gazebo. That's the resting place. The girl is all alone on the bench asleep. I turned to the gas station staff, 
and they said they saw a man and a young woman drop the child off a couple of hours ago, get into a car, and drive away. They never came back, and the girl sleeps and sleeps. Is that normal? I couldn't leave the kids alone, could I? I put them in the back seat and brought them to you. You're a doctor. Almost. See what's wrong with her. The baby's condition looks like she's intoxicated. It can happen. If you overdose a small child, we'll flush her stomach. A frightened Polly went into shock. She didn't want any more trouble than that. Her husband would kill her. She'd have to leave the village on any pretext for such experiments. Let Mary sort it out for herself. Don't go to the police, you woman. I'll go to jail. You'll have to prove you meant well. Let the girl stay here in the fresh air. I've got to get home now. I'd forgotten my husband, and I were invited to an important party tonight. Mary wasn't dumb or naive or stupid. She was just a deeply decent person. Not often out in the thick of urban civilization, more in touch with nature. The same kind-hearted neighbors and wordless animals. It never occurred to her that her daughtery niece was twisting and turning and making things up. Now she was only concerned about the condition of the pretty little girl, who was not spoiled even by the scar that distorted her forehead. After seeing her relative to the gate, she hurried to her patient, brewed a decoction of herbs with the properties of detox. The little girl was still in a kind of anabiosis, as under anesthesia, eyes cloudy. I don't want to have to take her to the district hospital, about how she would explain to those around her where she'd taken the baby from. Mary didn't even think about it. The healer rummaged through the medicine cabinet at home. She found more or less suitable bandages. It was good that she had some medication in her supply. She estimated the girl's weight and calculated the doses. I put her on a drip. She had all the necessary equipment for that. After a few hours of effort, her cheeks were a little gloomy. She moved faintly and opened her big brown eyes. Give me something to drink. Polly whispered, What is your name? My good one. Where are your parents? Throwing questions at her, did Mary. I don't know, answered the girl. I don't remember anything. There's fog everywhere. The river glistens in the sun, the road, and the trees on the sides. I want to sleep. The stress of being kidnapped, strangers, strong sleeping pills, capable of knocking an elephant off its feet, have played a trick on Polly. The little girl's brain gave orders to her memory to block out all memories of her former life. For a time she forgot both Anne her mother and Thomas her father and all her childhood in a big beautiful apartment with the toys of her own room, her favorite cartoons and books. It took Mary a long time to bring the girl to her senses. She drank goat's milk with honey, herbal teas with hearty pies, treated her to raspberry jam, and fed her country cottage cheese with sour cream. The little goat caused the girl's most violent reaction. It had recently been born to her nursing goat. This was the first time Mary had seen the baby she had rescued smile. The neighbors were answered briefly, of course, by the questions that arose. The family of a distant relative was killed in an accident. The girl was in danger of staying in an orphanage. The guardianship authorities were already approaching from all sides. It was good that the country was still in turmoil. People with compassion let me know about the trouble, and then the orphan herself was brought to me. Mary had a close friend of hers, a friend of Jack's, working in the township administration at the time. The man did not ask her unnecessary questions, being satisfied with her story. What about the little girl's papers? He asked, realizing that without official registration, the new resident of the village would not be able to get into school or other institutions. What do you call her, or do you call yourself Mary? It is good to live in a village, reliably protected from curious citizens and authorities. The swamp. No commission, no inspecting authorities would ever stop by. Mary thought for a while and answered her cousin. She and her husband aptized his son. Put it that way. May I hope I don't have to explain why the name sounds like that. Mary's niece, who brought the baby, sent her word a few months later. The letter said, We're going to live in Canada. My husband was offered a job there, and I'm a part of the girl, so do what you want. 
But don't you dare put me in the middle of this story. I'll deny it. I'll beg off. You're the one who found her in the woods. I hope she's alive. You managed to get her out. The boomerang of the earth is a sure thing. Getting ahead of myself, I want to tell you that the punishment found a promiscuous criminal in Canada as well. When the husband established himself in the West, he wanted to have hairs. His wife wouldn't tell him that she didn't want to take care of the little ones under any circumstances. She kept all the birth control pills under her pillow when she realized it was too late to get out of the pregnancy. She had never been very good at dosages of drugs, so she not only ensured her freedom from Chad, but also a severe hormonal imbalance in her body. She began to lose her doll-like, model-like appearance catastrophically. All floated and faded. When my husband saw what was going on with my wife, he did not think much about it. He still believed that his wife was the calling card of a successful man. The foolish woman in Canada went out with her things after three years. First the spouse, unashamed of the new perfect-looking young lady's home, began to bring, evicting his wife to the outhouse, and then finally pointed at the door with a small severance package. The former beauty was panic-stricken to return home after her black affairs. She had to remember her first profession as a master pedicurist. Crust of professional skill she did not take with them from home. She had to start with almost free service to marginalized individuals in one of the local hospitals. Then she went to a salon for the poor. So much footwork, so that she had enough to buy a piece of bread. I couldn't wish it on anyone, but I never understood why she was being punished by heaven. She was never very bright. From there on, her trail to Canada was lost. That's how a new local resident appeared in a remote village of fifty households, where the most fervent supporters of the forest, subsistence farming, and good deeds lived. O oh Lord, your works are marvelous. What in this world doesn't happen? At that very time in town, Anne had not yet caught an infection. She hadn't cursed the day she'd committed the worst atrocity of her life. Thomas was still on an unspoken search for Polly. He hoped and believed that a miracle would happen. It was still possible to fix something, to put the plot on a different track. Heaven had decided otherwise. It was as if fate had purposely taken the witnesses to heaven or to a foreign land. Who knew anything about the fate of the little girl with the scar? In the late 90s at the turn of the 21st century, Anne's condition deteriorated dramatically. She learned the exact diagnosis in 1997. At that time, there were no effective drugs or treatment methods. She grabbed every contagion that passed by. Her serious illness gave her no chance to be cured. Her immune system was failing, and when she was knocked down in earnest by a severe pneumonia, she decided she would not live anyway. Everything that happens is retaliation for what she did to her daughter Polly. She had to confess everything to Thomas. She calls her ex-husband to tell him that they need to meet immediately. It's about Polly. A comfortless father would have rushed to the hospital in a flash. But he was on another business trip abroad. He returned three days later. It was too late. In Anne's belongings, who had died of pulmonary edema. There was no note or any sign of what she wanted to tell Thomas before she died. When everything becomes unimportant, and many truths are revealed that people had previously kept quiet about. The man dug through everything left in his ex-wife's rented apartment. He found nothing either, and as a result wrote off her desire to talk to him as the delirium of a seriously ill person. Gone were the last traces of the past, sunk into obscurity. Life in the village, despite everything here May Polly, was new to her. It was very much to her liking. She couldn't remember how her day used to go. Her body's defensive reaction held her armor tight. Sometimes scraps of some images came to her in her dreams. An affectionate man carrying her in his arms to her crib. A woman braiding her unruly mane of hair into pigtails. A plush, striped tiger cub. The new experiences of country life gave her so many that she painlessly learned to respond to the name. May Mary confusedly called her aunt. Sometimes I would go out of my way to call her mother. Already masterful at feeding the animals in their large household. Chickens, ducks, two boars, a cow, a goat with a small cub. The smaller brethren were spoiled. 
If I could, I would live in a stable and a chicken coop. Mary even had to cut chickens to their home table at night. Otherwise, it would have been a tragedy for the girl. Good thing there were so many to count, she wouldn't notice they were missing. In September, along with all eight other kids from the village, Mai went to first grade. Elementary education in recent years was organized on the basis of their village library. Then the children moved to the district, to a boarding school. They came home on weekends. The years flew by, quickly managing to turn around. Mary slowly taught her daughter her craft. At 15, May could give anyone in the village an injection, even a therapeutic massage. But only if it was on weekends, when she came home from school for a visit. Her biggest love was, and still is, her little brothers of all stripes. She could wander spellbound for hours in the barnyard, not a bit reluctant to clean up the mess and feed her many friends. And one day she said to Mary, I'm going to study to be a veterinarian. You have to take care of the fauna, and we have turned them into food or entertainment. I understand, and I eat chicken noodles with undisguised pleasure. Still, I would like to alleviate the suffering of animals and birds, nurse them, cure them, and help them procreate. If we were rich, I would start a kennel, where they would bring uninformed animals and bring them. Their owners got in trouble, got sick, and left them to their fate, not knowing before that living with their pets was a responsibility. I would take these poor souls to a holding facility and make a comfortable hotel for people who wanted to leave their pets in someone else's care, while they go to the hospital, away on business or vacation. It's a good business. It's a wonderful profession. Mary smiled back at her. You better find out where you have to go to learn to be a professional. I have some savings. I'll put it towards your education. Mary thought about it. What treasures do she and her mother have? Ridiculous. It's a wooden house. Jack and his whole village helped build a big yard with outbuildings. That's a fact. In the house, the stove that native Russian girl had long ago learned to make porridge and cabbage soup in it. If Mary was busy being sick, there are three rooms in the building. Large spacious in the hall, the TV is big and thick with important wide sides. What is a flat screen and plasma? She'd only seen high beds in the neighborhood with fluffy, down pillows and blankets. Curtains on the windows. Mary had embroidered her own ironwork. In the kitchen, a wide again wooden table with ornate, brightly patterned cliques. Carved benches with carved backs, a samover on the table. The shelves on the walls are full of earthenware with hand-painted barrels. Mai was no fool to have seen her girlfriend's houses in the neighborhood with different furnishings, high-tech, shiny silver and black appliances, and glass tables. No one argues. Trendy and classy, I guess. But she was comfortable with their nice, familiar surroundings that didn't make her feel ashamed of her poverty. Rejection did not arise in the want fashionable and modern style. Here her soul sang and her heart rejoiced that sometimes it would be more expensive than all the treasures of the world. When the time comes, it will be possible for her to manage the household as a woman. Then it will be seen what old or new coloring to give it. Outside the house, two houses away, the forest begins. There, of course, and mushrooms, and berries, and wild nuts, and grasses in the glades of the sea boundless, they are the owners of all this wealth. But you will not earn much money from this natural treasure. Mary has never taken a bribe from her fellow villagers for her medical services. So if they really insisted, a jar of jam, a jar of salted cucumbers, a dozen eggs of rabbit meat, soon the tale is told. Yeah, sometimes things don't get done soon enough. Next to Mary May, she was like a stone wall, just a little savage. Knowledge of the civilized world was limited to two trips into town and TV shows. Internet mastered not the Stone Age, but in their village it was a rare guest, caught in the mood. Fiber optics was promised, not brought in so far in the village in recent years. As it turns out, there were fewer and fewer young people. And the elderly, what for the hell these technical gadgets? Not on the famous Black Sea has never been, not on other trips. Summer vacations in the countryside, the long lines of jars with canned food on the shelves of the storeroom. 
in the yard and the house to patch up if there are gaps. Naive and old-fashioned was in matters of relations between men and women. Complexova strongly sensed her friendship with a handsome classmate Evil Tongues called a new version of the handsome and the beast. Growing up she grew a scar on her forehead. Irregular facial features with a chiseled nose did not save the overall picture. Small brown eyes with long eyelashes, not lush dark hair falling on her shoulders in a thick wave. Ugly, outlined puffy lips. The scar managed to negate all the beauty. Over the years, it covered half my forehead. The doctors had been right. She should have gotten rid of that ugliness when she was a child. Mary had long applied herbal lotions to the purple crescent, made creams from natural products. These treatments were able to remove the brightness of the clear crescent from its crimson tone to a soft pink. From a distance, the blemish was no longer so visible. Up close, alas, it remained visible. That was what had taught May to stay away from male representatives. It was not her destiny to become someone's sweetheart. But inside her slender, supple body there was a kind, merciful heart beating. Animals in the neighborhood recognized Mary a block away. Many of them she was treating a wounded paw, or ticks took out, or cleaned the ears, or calmed out the hair, which took up lumps. Neighbors even began to call her more often. If it was an easy case, Mary was not disturbed unnecessarily. People used to say she was like a witch in the woods. The language of animals and birds understands problems. It reads them from her muzzle. The girl was unlucky to be an orphan. Even though Mary calls her mother, she's a distant relative and her face is all messed up. She graduated from high school at a boarding school in the district with three B's in her report card and passed all her exams with good grades. I applied to the university, majoring in clinical veterinary medicine, but the competition for spots on the state budget was too tough. The girl was faced with the issue of tuition fees for the commercial department. She and Mary had a brief consultation. They decided that the dream should not be given up under any circumstances. Mary replayed the original decision, sent her paperwork to the part-time version of the veterinary medicine department. There, the cost was affordable. She would get a job and get the money herself. Her grades were good enough to get her into the program. Correspondence applicants with such certificates were a rarity. It didn't take long for her to get a job. The eldest daughter of the same cousin Mary who had helped her with the papers. She was going on maternity leave. She and her husband worked as a couple at a roadside cafe. He was a cook by trade. She was a waitress. So May, under the watchful eye of her older male companion, would also be supervised. It all worked out, it all worked out. They let the girl go to her sessions without any problems. She studied selflessly. She got straight A's in her report card. Yes, excellent. And so five more years flew by. Mary and May were getting ready to celebrate the girl's 25th birthday in the summer. In the village, both holidays and sorrows are ruled by the whole world. Mary said, daughter, Let's get people together in a month for your celebration. You will be on vacation, and if you have to work, as always released with a good soul on such an occasion, I'll scrape together some supplies. I'll make raspberry and cherry naluka, but there's no one to drink it. It's been a long time since we all sat here together, not since the wedding of my cousin's children. It's a rare labor holiday in the countryside. And indeed, Mother Mary, Let's sing our songs. Let's reminisce about happy or funny moments from our village life. Maybe some of my peers will stop by my parents' house on vacation. The date was set for the last Saturday in August. It was just after Mary's birthday. Falling on Wednesday itself, May would have time to make up for it at work. Then she would take the day off. In the village, too, a big feast would have to be organized for the whole settlement. We live once. Why not? Thomas's jubilee had already begun in the morning. Greetings from numerous colleagues and partners, huge cards, impressive and tiny boxes with gifts, tied with bright ribbons and all shades of colorful palette. Endless amounts of fresh flowers from democratic daisies to aristocratic orchids. A small buffet in a working atmosphere was very hearty. The man in the company was sincerely loved 
and most importantly respected for his undoubted talent as a daring architect. Everyone was looking forward to the gala evening at the restaurant, which promised many surprises and pleasant moments. Thomas himself wasn't exactly looking forward to it. He just understood people wanted to pay tribute to his attitude. This is the moment in life that should be experienced and enjoyed to the fullest. Clothes for the banquet alone, of course, and did not think to prepare him. It's a barmaid, as it turns out. She thought that the world should revolve around her and her desires, and she just let the plebs admire themselves. With annoyance, the Jubilee had to go to the boutique, where the sales girls dressed him from head to toe. An elegant classic suit of dark blue, a soft blue shirt, a tie a few shades darker in the same color scheme. Elegant, soft, comfortable shoes, a la London dandy. Thomas examined himself in the mirror. He was quite pleased with his appearance as a fifty-year-old gentleman. He couldn't get used to the idea that he was in his sixth decade. And what about the anamnesis? The Luna flatly refused to give him an air, although when they had just spent a lot of time together, always nodded her head in agreement in response to his paternal dreams. All the festivities associated with the milestone date will take place. He would initiate a divorce, and now he wouldn't even think about such an annoying nuisance in his life as his legal spouse. Driving home, he called out to the Snow Queen, Are you ready to go to the restaurant? My company car is waiting for us downstairs. I'm not driving tonight, and I wouldn't advise you to either. Then Alumna pouted angrily, and she gritted her teeth. I'll take my swallow, leave it in the parking lot of the restaurant, or call a sober driver. I don't like the smell of other people's cars. Even the smell of freshener in your company car irritates me. A woman with a horse is easier on the mare. Thomas grinned to himself. He wouldn't have to put up with Alona. On the way to the restaurant, he didn't complain about the extravagant notes of her perfume either. How different and alien we are, Thomas thought to himself, and said aloud, Do as you like, but try to keep up appearances. More than two hundred important people have been invited to the banquet, including the mayor of our city, my new business partners. I don't want to be embarrassed for you. Everything was going great at the gala, and the birthday boy smiled at his secretary Alice from afar. The girl is not so hopeless, the appearance of the fairer sex, and with her made me jump to conclusions. Well, she likes bright makeup, reminiscent of the battle paint of the Indians. She has never failed in business. She should get an individual award for her excellent organization of his landmark birthday party. Iloma, on the other hand, was excited and puzzled. She stood by his side during the parade of congratulations while the official part was going on. Then she disappeared somewhere. There were so many people at this reception that the Jubilee himself got a little tired and took a glass of cognac. Thomas slipped out onto the open terrace and sat down in one of the back chairs behind some huge plant with large leathery leaves. A few minutes later, voices could be heard on the terrace. In a cooing tempo, the man recognized the voice of his wife. Thomas has no idea of our affair, beloved. What makes you think he looks at you suspiciously? The Jubilee is all packed. He decided not to reveal himself. The lovebirds continued their dialogue. Your husband, our architectural company blocks all the oxygen, all the expensive projects go to him, and we only crumbs from his table. Now Thomas knew who Ilona was softly coddling. It was the head of a partner company of an institution, a pretty well-established, well-known name in their professional sphere. In all business meetings, this is not that of a competitor, but rather a related party. He was as courteous and polite as possible. Neither expensive nor displeased, he never showed any displeasure. As far as Thomas knew the man had recently divorced his wife, whether or not his capital and indolence Lona decided to put her predatory paws on him. At this time the woman said words that made the birthday boy so uncomfortable that he could barely restrain himself from giving away his presents. She whispered in a low voice, and let's go to the bathroom. I want to be like that first time when we were both blown away at that corporate party in this restaurant. The sanitary rooms are like in a palace of some kind. The cleanliness and spotlessness and the numbers are off the charts. No one is bothered by us. 
No one will notice our long absence. The Lona laughed a loud, unfamiliar laughter and took her lover with her. Her husband was furious. What an abomination, an abomination. How could he make such a mistake with this low woman? It's not even the fact that she's cheating. The slap is about the setting of the entourage. The desire to humiliate him in this way. You, a well-known architect in the city, are in demand and rich. So let it hurt you more. Thomas's thoughts were confused. There could be a much more primitive motive to explain her behavior. Indifference. A huge, slippery, consumer indifference. Where it doesn't matter what a money bag lies on. What his desires, dreams, doubts, how his day went. Did he come home in a shield or under a shield? Iloma had been fishing for richer fish from the start, among tourists' compatriots who managed to afford a trip to Barcelona. So she hung around the Sagrada Temple. All the rest was staged in advance game with her pretty face, and he fell for it. And how? The man finished his glass of cognac in a gulp and rushed away from this restaurant, from this filth in which he had been dumped. From this evening, where they had just so cynically trampled his landmark anniversary, away from the woman he had never wronged, except that he hadn't been the most attentive husband while he was making money for her life. The cab arrived quickly. Let his guests continue to entertain themselves. He would now call his secretary and have her handle the situation of his hasty departure. It's ten o'clock at night. The party is in full swing. There is a fair amount of hot drinks and hors d'oeuvres. No one is offended. No one cares. He needs to be alone to rethink things. Thomas's cabbie was tactful and taciturn. When he was told to drive 300 kilometers along the federal highway, he reacted as if he were given a specific address or a specific place. Thomas did not know what was now written on his face, but he guessed that it was definitely not a mask of bubble-headed joy and contentment. He began to calm down a little as the trees and streetlights began to flash outside the window. And then, all of a sudden, he fell asleep soundly in the back seat. The stress and tension I had gone through had an effect. I woke up a few hours later. The car was parked outside a traffic cafe. The cab driver was dozing quietly at the wheel. Where are we? He asked, not understanding anything. And then suddenly, all at once he remembered the yesterday's holiday, his wonderfully organized birthday, streams of congratulatory speeches, and then the surprise from his wife. The man rubbed the boy driver's shoulder. I repeat my question. Where are we? Dawn. There's a sign. 300 kilometers from our town. There's a small pitechic here. There are a few catering outlets, a marketplace with grannies and aunts from the countryside. They sell natural products. I figured you had to come here for something. The customer is always right. And if you're not right, see paragraph one, which says that the customer is always right. Why didn't you wake me up? Philosopher, you got into my car yesterday with such a face. You were in such a hurry. I thought someone had died. Your skin was whiter than chalk. Your eyes were glistening feverishly. At first I thought you'd had a decent booze, but then I realized you hadn't had that much to drink. You're dressed very expensive. My sister works in a boutique. I know a bit about high-end clothes. You're wearing a luxury Swiss watch, and you look polished and well-groomed. People have all sorts of things going on. If you went out into the night, you had to. Thomas mentally agreed with the chauffeur's arguments. He was grateful that he did not ask him anything. To have to slow him down when he fell asleep, demanding urgent action and any decisions. Outside the window, women began to gather around the wooden stalls that had been cut up, pulling out their wealth with their hands. Some of them were poultry carcasses and eggs, some were strings of dried mushrooms, and a row of glass jars of canned goods lined up. Boxes were filled with vegetables from the beds, only 300 kilometers away from the little known, albeit provincial, city where Thomas lived, there was a whole other world around him. What world? It's a different planet, a different scale. A car with fresh muddy tires pulled up to a patch of coffee shops. A pretty girl jumped out of it. She said something to the man behind the wheel 
and walked toward one of the roadside eateries. A chance encounter. Thomas read the name of the cafe. He made a decision and announced it to his companion, and that the restroom would be a good place to at least wash up, freshen up his face, then to get a coffee and surely an egg made of three eggs from the village chicken in butter. He was sure, for some reason, that the cafe would only cook natural meat products for travelers. The laws of logistics could not be cheated. Why bring raw materials for dishes from the district center or from the city? Meanwhile, the girl opened the door to the cafe and disappeared behind them for a while, but soon reappeared with a large bowl of food, which she immediately offered to a large shaggy dog peacefully doozing near the booth. Don't be lazy, you clumsy bear. Boniface, I'm talking to you, by the way. Go and eat. I'll be busy all day later. The dog slowly got up, dipped his muzzle almost up to his ears in the treats, and peacefully ruminated with strong jaws. Then came to thank the girl, putting his powerful dirty paws on her shoulders. Come on, you liquor. The girl responded to his gratitude. The first customers will be here soon. I haven't changed yet. She turned to Thomas and the cab driver and asked graciously, Are you waiting for the opening? It'll be ten minutes soon. But if you can't wait, come inside. I already turned on the air conditioner. It's a hot August. Thomas couldn't hear what she was saying. He didn't understand a word she was saying. He looked at the hospitable woman and could not say a word. She had the exact same scar on her face as his daughter Polly. The same shape, the same location too. Only pale, not as purple as the girls, and somehow more neat, which, alas, did not make its size any smaller. He followed the girl like a rat behind a doodle into a cool café, sat down at the table indicated to him, from which the owner of Polly's scar brushed off invisible drips. He accepted the folder with the menu from her hands. Opposite Thomas, yesterday's cab driver sat at the table and asked him just one question. What's wrong with you again? You look like you've seen a ghost. You don't have a face on you again. Your lips have turned white. Are you ill with your heart? Thomas didn't answer. He didn't have the strength to talk. His mind was filled with fragments of memories. Anne, Polly, the river, the boat, the search, the cab driver, the surprisingly intuitive fellow. I decided not to bother him again. Started flipping through the pages of the price list. When the girl approached them, again clearly reported two portions of eggs to, to us. Three eggs break, please. Salad of cucumbers and tomatoes with greens and sour cream, a cut of sausage and cheese, two large cups of strong coffee. You probably don't drink instant coffee, the waitress replied. The girl had already put on a white apron and a cap on her hair, and her namadeg on her chest bore May's name, and Thomas immediately dug his eyes into the little information plate. He thought he was going crazy. Bring what you have, but don't forget the sugar, the cab driver muttered. I'll make it in a minute, because our cook is late." May smiled and left for the kitchen. While she was gone, Thomas recovered a little. You never know what happens in life to someone else's girl, about the same time as their daughter was injured. So now she lives with an ugly scar. The men ate with evident appetite. May knew how to cook deliciously. And then the rest of the cafe workers began to arrive. The cab driver asked him if Thomas was going home or if he had to go alone. Thomas had already paid him generously for all his services. Give me ten more minutes, please, and then we will be on our way back. The cab driver said he would smoke outside for a while, and Thomas walked over to a small counter that sold drinks, pastries, and baked goods, some kind of croutons and potato chips, all sorts of snacks. The friendly woman behind the counter smiled at him. Is there something you want to buy? No, I'd like to know where this girl may lives. What do you need her for? The woman was surprised. I don't think I've seen you around here before. I think she resembles a distant relative of mine from these parts, the older one. But the resemblance is so strong that I'm confused. That aunt and I lost touch a long time ago. And I would like to renew it. In the countryside, people are decent, honest. 
trusting saleswoman in the cafe did not see any underside in the questions of a strange man. May lives in the countryside from here a few kilometers away. We first earned money for her studies and now after graduation. For a shelter for homeless animals. We're all invited to her birthday party in two days. She'll be 25 years old. You should come too. The whole village will be there. You can ask people all your questions. Thomas was taking a cab back to the city and mentally prioritized. The first and most important thing was to call his lawyer immediately and prepare the documents for the divorce. He is not greedy and he is not a crook, but he remembers the lines from the prenuptial agreement by heart. In the case of adultery, spouse after divorce has no right to property and material claims. Something like that is spelled out in the document. Let Ilona only dare open her pretty mouth. He will tell her the whole scene on the terrace of the restaurant in a flash. The second question is May's girlfriend in the village, and it is only one day before her birthday. He will go there, and he will find out the truth, whatever it may be. He will, and if necessary, to prove paternity, all the necessary DNA tests will find witnesses to the life of the waitress among her fellow villagers. He must treat these people with the utmost discretion. He knows what life's conflicts and troubles are. He had no right to offend anyone with unfounded suspicions. Thomas pressed the secretary's call button, smiling once again at the dashing appearance of Alice, who instantly materialized at his call in the office. Alice, I want to thank you again for the impeccable organization of my anniversary banquet. I've already put in an order for you to receive a bonus for your efforts. And now I have a delicate new assignment for you. I have brought all the necessary papers from home. Prepare a binder for my lawyer that will cover my divorce proceedings. Are you going to get a divorce? Mumbled his assistant, always confident. Thomas looked up at her in surprise. Do I have some kind of diction defect? Did I say something ambiguous? Yes, yes, I understood everything. Immediately returned to the usual readiness of the girl. I'll get right on that errand of yours. After talking to the secretary, Thomas dialed the cell phone number of the cab driver with whom they had recently spent the night together in the car. As they parted, they exchanged contacts. William, hello, it's your recent client with whom you've been driving kilometers around the region. Thomas smiled to himself. The mood was great. He could not even explain to himself why he was so happy, though there was no need to lie. For some time now, he had been filled with a shaky hope in his soul. Are you working the day after tomorrow? May I engage you for the whole day, so that we can go again to the places we are already familiar with? I am free for you. His tactful and wise carrier smiled back. What time should I pick you up? Five o'clock, I think would be fine. I shall have to make a survey of the place. The next morning Thomas had another unexpected surprise. When he walked into his reception room in the place of his secretary Alice was sitting an unknown young woman. Ah, Thomas was a little confused. Is my assistant sick? Did human resources send you to replace her? The blonde woman looked up at the boss with clear blue eyes. Thomas did not recognize your secretary without makeup. Thomas was dumbfounded by the pretty, almost no makeup girl. Only a little gloss adorned her luscious lips today. She was outwardly the exact opposite of his militant Indian, perpetually painted in all the colors of the rainbow. The woman rose from the table. The same familiar, long, slender colt legs today were hidden beneath an elegant black pencil skirt. A white blouse with tightly buttoned buttons completed the new and transformed portrait of the stranger. Shall I come in to explain myself to you, Thomas? Or are you busy at the moment? Dazed by the metamorphosis of Alice's appearance, Thomas nodded silently. He had no words. The woman continued into his office. I've deceived you a little over the years. Confused you. And you didn't notice anything. I'm 32 years old. I'm an architect by profession. I graduated from the same school as you. I've always admired your brilliant projects. I dreamed of being on your team. But as a professional, I wasn't interested in your human resources. Alice excitedly pulled up her skirt as if to remove the invisible folds from it, 
to be closer to you graduated from the secretarial assistant courses, learned fluent English and French, to be useful to you on foreign business trips. But you always looked at me as an empty place, although I managed to become your personal assistant at the price of heroic efforts. I got married, had a son, whom I love very much. He is now five years old. My husband never shared my obsession with architecture. He was into fishing, beer with friends, lewd jokes and roller skates. Our relationship came to a natural end. The boy stayed with me. Now I could be your shadow, your partner in architecture. After all, I'd been in love with you for a long time. But you met Alona, and you plunged headlong into a relationship, and then we tied ourselves in marriage to this woman. I'm not allowed to be involved with a married man. I added even more makeup to my protective face mask so you wouldn't see my true feelings of my frustrations and my pain. You can fire me after this confession of mine. I only decided to do it after I found out you were preparing divorce papers. No matter what happens next in your life, you know you have a loyal, faithful friend. You can always count on me. At the end of the monologue, Alice's voice trembled. Tears came to her eyes. When she had finished, she turned abruptly on her heels and added, Your strong black coffee with two lumps of sugar is already prepared. I'll bring it to you right away. When the door closed behind the secretary, Thomas could not contain his emotions. To say that he immediately fell in love with Alice and went to heaven would be silly. He was surprised that he was blind to many things, that he took other people's care and participation for granted, believing that the best reward was not a warm word of thanks, but a bonus. Women and teachers were good in this regard, so he did not learn to distinguish between unselfishness and commercialism. He decided that he would think about it later. In the meantime, he went to pick out an anniversary present for May. His decision might have seemed entertaining to some, but he didn't go to boutiques with fashionable clothes, cosmetics and perfume stores or jewelry salons. He hovered for a few hours at a pet supply outlet with little understanding of this area, buying not strictly professional items, but dry food for whiskered striped biters, toys and gadgets for training, beautiful collars, and other accessories. Even yesterday he made a decision. If May has nothing to do with his daughter, he will still sponsor her with a kennel for homeless animals. Let these purchases be his beginning. In Polly's memory, as we drove with William to the village, we had time to talk about many things, but Thomas never told the cab driver the purpose of his visit. The village behind the marsh was easy to find, as was the courtyard where the feast was being prepared. In the middle of the open space, wooden tables and benches were already flaunting themselves. Plates, glasses, forks and spoons were placed along the perimeter of the future feast. Serving in a village without extravagances, as long as it was comfortable and tasty for everyone. Thomas caught himself thinking that he liked this approach. An elderly woman was fiddling with the tables. When she saw the strangers, she turned around briskly and was dumbfounded. May's instincts were always excellent. She'd been in a state of confusion since morning. She was singing and sad at the same time. The nurse chalked it up to excitement. After all, May was twenty-five years old, a quarter of her life. The man looking at her playfully now stirred her heart. She didn't see the good in him, but she felt his arrival would turn her life upside down. Come in, good people. Share the table and shelter with us. The old woman said a friendly hello. When she looked closer, without prompting, she knew without a doubt. Her May's eyes were looking at her. The man and her adopted daughter had them like two images in the same mirror, exactly the same. Here came the moment of truth she had waited all her life for. The time had come for May to learn the truth about her childhood. Then, nineteen years ago, the girl was still asking her questions about herself when her memory came back to her in fragments. But then she had grown so fond of life in the woods that all questioning had come to naught. Landlady, unfortunately, I don't know your name. Turn to the woman Thomas. I happen to know that your daughter is planning to open a kennel for homeless animals. Here are some supplies I brought for her future farm. May went to the cafe where she works. They're cooking hot meals for our gala. 
You and I have an hour to talk. I know you have questions for me. If Thomas was surprised by Aunt Mary's sagacity, he didn't show it. He went into the house. My only question is, how did your daughter get hurt? How did she get that mark on her face? Mary pulled herself together, shook off all doubts, somehow realizing that no one would punish her for raising someone else's child. No one would condemn her. She decided to remove the heaviness in her soul and to tell the whole truth during her long confession. The man asked only one question. What was the name of your niece who had brought you the girl almost twenty years ago? The enigmatic mystery of the crescent moon, which had tormented Thomas for two decades, has come together in a jigsaw puzzle. He had always believed, quietly within himself, that Polly was alive, that the case surrounding her supposed death was not clear, that Anne was involved, and someone was helping her. Now the whole picture was roughly clear to him. He didn't believe for a second that Polly had slept in the gazebo at the gas station. He matched the disappearance of Anne's girlfriends with their family horizon, and he was also eternally grateful to this toiler that she had nursed his daughter, raised her, educated her, and given her a kind heart. There was no need for any DNA tests, his heart was beginning to come alive and beat as smoothly as it had years earlier, when his marriage to Anne had just begun. Now it was his turn to tell Mary about the twists and turns of his life, about how Polly had been injured carrying crystal goblets in her children's hands, about the scheduled plastic surgery in Switzerland, about the betrayal and death of Polly's mother. Mary believed him wholeheartedly from the first words. Her gut felt it. This was how it was in the life of this not the luckiest man. We're not going to dump all this unusual news on May today, Thomas said. Let's just enjoy the girl's holiday. There's a car pulling up already. Introduce me for the time being as a regular sponsor who also loves the animal world. May Polly's jubilee was very warm. Thomas enjoyed listening to all the words of gratitude expressed to his daughter by the many guests. The table was broken. The lingering, sweet Neluca flowed over the glasses. Everybody shared the memories and wished the birthday girl that her dream had come true. Connected with the nursery for pets, in the evening pop hits mixed with something folk soulful were sung. Thomas and William never ceased to marvel that the people here were very different, not as acquisitive and calculating businessmen. They worked with dignity and rested cheerfully. Between meals, Mary and Thomas exchanged a few more words. He told the woman about his plans to take his daughter to Switzerland for a plastic surgery, to help her with the organization of the baby for the little brothers, and to tell her a little about himself and his life. We headed home well past midnight. My Polly, my soul, and my heart, thought Thomas in the car. Things will be different now. If you want, I will change your life and your status dramatically. If you choose another life, I will understand and accept your decision. Thomas caught himself really wanting to share his joy with his faithful assistant Alice. The demark of this pretty young woman also struck him to the core. He will take a closer look at her. Certainly he wouldn't fire her for her honesty and openness in expressing her feelings. He didn't know what his life would become now, but he was sure it would surely be happy. The ugly scar on Polly's face would disappear. The old wounds would finally heal.